Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Horse Geeks podcast, where we look at horses and riding from the inside out. I'm Kirsten Nelson, professional horse trainer. And with me today is a different Alexander Technique instructor. Usually Deb is, she's a co-host, really. She's on so often. Um, and Jana Tift is one of my personal Alexander Technique instructors. And so I was thrilled. I am thrilled to have you here. And what I've noticed with Alexander Technique instructors, there are no two that are the same. And each one is fascinating. So welcome, Jana Tift. And today's topic is going to be about, uh, we're going to touch on the lateral muscles because no other Alexander Technique instructor has been able to explain to me what you explained to me about the lateral muscles. And that was a big deal to me. It was a very me big too. deal. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So why don't we start off, just maybe say a little bit about anything about your Alexander Technique work or your background or what you specialize in so we can get to know you. Okay. Well, thanks so much for having me on, Kirsten. And it's it's lovely to be here and to see you virtually, though we're uh, about, what, 3,000 miles apart? I know, we both moved. <laughs> yeah. So um, <clears throat> you and I met 15 years ago. Um, when you called me about, yeah, about Alexander lessons and, um, we began meeting regularly and I even began teaching in your program. I had been teaching Alexander for about 15 years at that point. It's getting close to 30 now. And, um, I had ridden as a child, but I never had instruction in writing. I just knew horses and, and loved them and loved being around them and loved being around horse people. And so um, you and I found a common language, I think. Very and, much, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. So um, my background is mainly in the performing arts is where I've worked, but the principles of the Alexander Technique. They go everywhere, but- they go everywhere. I think yeah. it's much more well known. Uh, I think you worked in a theater department for a university and with musicians and in theater or performing arts, lots and lots of people have heard about Alexander Technique. Absolutely. However, when I was training to be a teacher, Sally Swift, the great centered writing person came yes. to our school and taught us and it was mind blowing, you know, um, everything that she had to offer us about how to allow and communication. Yes, yes. And so it, everything she has in her book you got a doorbell. Oh, I do. That's I do. <laughs> right, it's okay. Yeah, it's it's our <laughs> special podcast. Sometimes and now my, the dog comes. Oh, that's and now fine. The dog comes. Sometimes my cat crosses the screen. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> I've had that happen also. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, like Sally Swift's work is was she an Alexander Technique instructor, or she came she, to it? She was not, but a number of people who were Alexander teachers were studying with her so that they could translate their work to horseback riding. Mm. Um, and um, yeah, and she did study Alexander technique. You know? Yeah, because it was sort of the same experience for me working on my balance as a rider. I was doing long before I was introduced to the Alexander technique, but I went, oh my gosh, this is so similar. I wanna learn what this Alexander technique is, thinking it was some new thing. Little did I know it had started around the turn of the century, like early 1900s, <laughs> not early 2000s. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that it was well known in a lot of circles. But other than Sally Swift's work, it's not all that well known in the horse world. 
And when Deb yeah. and I do a pod, there's so much that overlaps with working on not only rider balance, but how horses have to find their own coordination. Absolutely. And, and if we're riding them and working on that, they're doing it with weight on their back too. Well, they absolutely are. And it is our coordination that can assist or interfere with our horse's coordination. We are constantly, constantly transmitting information to our horse when we ride. Yes. And that's what was so interesting to me that the Alexander technique, when when you as my instructor would do what we call put hands on people, it what blew me away was the amount of information that was coming from your body to my body through your hands, but there wasn't a single manipulation of the body. And and I was I went, it's like dance partners or riding a horse. I go the it, for a horse and rider, the rider has to be the Alexander Technique instructor. And the horse is the one trying to find coordination with weight on their back. But that transference of information, it really blew me away. Um, when I was new to working with you regularly, I was like, wow. And some of what you showed me through your hands, I realized in the moment, I never in this lifetime would have figured out that particular coordination in my body without guidance. And yet that information was yours was already there or what I was doing would not have made one bit of difference. You know, right. It was your coordination, your innate built in coordination that my hands were speaking to. And it was just a matter of sort of not just, I don't want to say waking it up because really what it was, was everything that was interfering with that was falling away. Oh, you know? I like, yes, I love how you said that. Yeah, all yes. the tensions that that had interfered with that natural coordinated balance in your body, those fell away. And then what was already there could emerge. So it was just buried. Well, and I don't think you mean me specifically. I think that's true for every body. Oh, absolutely. Every yeah. single person. Yeah. Every single person. Um, and we'd love, that's to show pictures, we'd love to show pictures of babies. Oh, yes. You know? <laughs> um, when we're teaching, because, to remind us that nobody taught us to walk. And if you've ever been around a little child, they have seemingly endless energy. And even though they fall over a lot, you know, the really little ones who are just yeah. learning how to walk, their bodies are really very coordinated. You know? Yeah, because so, they don't have any muscle. Well, they have muscle, but they don't have interference. They don't, uh, they aren't trying to, you know, they aren't being asked to sit in a desk for six hours a day when they're six years old, for instance. Mm -hmm. And we have to sort of lock ourselves into place to keep from jumping and running around, you know, <laughs> whether we want to, when we yeah. sit, you know, so they haven't been interfered with by life, you know, by, mm. by what happens in modern society. Yeah. So, and I mean, I'm thinking of toddlers where I go, it's, you know, you're hoping they don't fall and get hurt. You're trying to prevent that. But otherwise, nobody tells us how to do it. They don't. And yeah. if you've ever watched a little child, like just sitting in there in a chair, perfectly balanced, perfectly upright, uh, because again, they don't have interference and um they aren't doing what you may have used this word with your students they aren't in end gaining yes that's a very alexander word well, yes it, it is. yes they aren't they aren't interested in the goal they're interested in what's happening right now 
And, you know, this came up actually dealing with a client who has a horse that's sort of in rehab. He comes with a lot of PTSD. He's had a hard life and she got him as a companion horse. But just in dealing with sort of handling, bathing, that kind of thing, he's still trying to bite her or kicking out or acting out. And so when we were working with it, something very similar to what you just said came up. I go, humans and what you're calling end gaming, I'll talk about as the human predatory instinct to focus and and hunt, right? So we're very good at focusing on something and getting it, whether that's an idea or our dinner, right? We're just good at that. Where horses, their eyesight is, their normal eyesight is much more like our peripheral vision. And so there's a, some great research papers on, you know, the rods, the cones, how they see, how they see distance. And really, it's almost like permanent peripheral vision. They don't have that focal vision that we have. And instead of end gaining, horses are much more process oriented. Like they want to know who you are in the process. And their language is very spatial. It's nonverbal. It's energy and spatial awareness is really how they communicate. And you taught me something about the kinesthetic sphere, which I would love for you to touch on a bit. That was a game changer. And I'm not even getting to what I was hoping to about the lateral muscles, but we'll get there if we get there. So <laughs> we'll get there eventually. Yeah. 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 Um, but can you yeah, talk so, about that spatial awareness and how that's related to your work? Absolutely. Um, we all have a personal reach space. About an arm's length. Yeah. About an arm's length. And that reach space goes all the way around our bodies. So for most of us, like when we're on the back of a horse, we tend to be thinking about this part of our body right here. Yeah, the front. The front, you know, see. And, and, the, and, and what we can see of the horse. Mm -hmm. And everything else is completely out of our awareness. So we're a three-dimensional body and our back has an awful lot to do with yes. our we're riding. And our balance, yes. And our balance, and even just holding the reins, your back has an awful lot to do with that. And uh, when we lose an awareness of our 3D body, a lot of times we're pushing into the front and forgetting that there's a whole lot of horse behind us. There's a whole, you know, and we want all of that to be in our awareness. The, the kinesphere, as we refer to it. Kinesphere, yeah, I couldn't remember yeah. what it was called or, exactly. Uh, right, which is actually not Alexander. It's the work of a wonderful um, movement specialist whose name is Rudolf Laban. But um, the, the kinesphere is our personal reach space. But your horse also has a kinesphere, right? Oh, a big one. A, bi a giant big one, one. I mean, really, really big. Mm -hmm. And when the two of you are as horse and rider, then those two kinospheres are intersecting. And just carrying that in your awareness, the idea that both your horse and yourself are 3D and that rider and horse um, occupy their kinospheres intersect. And in fact, you can even give yourself a, or give the two of you, a really big kinosphere that encompasses both the other kinospheres. So Absolutely. each horse and rider each have their personal space, which is quite large, it's mm -hmm. not here, it's here, yeah. you know, we yeah. each have our personal space, but we also have shared space. Absolutely. No, and I always, I in my work, I call it the personal space or the personal space bubble. 
and the horse has one, we have one. And it really, I like calling it the kinesphere sphere because I've always thought of it as an extension of our sense of touch. And yeah, it's really our sense of touch that's just taken out in space a little bit. And just bringing riders awareness to the idea, like I'll joke, I'll go, you get as much space as you want. It's free. It's readily available. You can make your space as big and have a lot of presence, as we say. Or I think when we're concentrating, especially related to that focal vision, it's like we're walling ourselves off from the back and the sides, maybe the down or the up. And we're sort of focused only right in front of us. And instantly I'll see riders' bodies change just with the thought that we are in the middle of a three-dimensional bubble, that there's even more than your foot in the stirrup, you're connected to the gravity of the arena, not just the horse. Our, and, you know, our bodies are very responsive to our eyes and our awareness. So if, if this is our awareness and we're only focused on those ears, our body is going to narrow yeah. and pull forward, you yeah. know? So when we expand, hello. Yes. <laughs> when we expand our awareness, then we're giving our body the chance to go, oh, oh, I've got all this space. I've got so some I don't room. need to be narrow. Yeah. 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 Right. And you'll notice that, you know, even as we sit here, you know, if we notice the space between ourselves and our computer, notice the space around the computer. Right. We can have as much as we want. Be aware of the fact we can have as much as we want and we don't have to be sucked in. Right. To the computer. Exactly. And I think just that intensity of focus sometimes will draw the whole body into that narrowing use. Right. As opposed and then, and then, to yeah. it, like we can be in the middle of a huge, I got to write this down. You called it again, the kinesthesia sphere kinesphere kinesphere yeah k-i-n n-e-s-p-h-e-r-e kinesphere kinesphere and who was the person rudolph was... rudolph von laban <laughs> von l-a-b-a-n I got it. Because when I was Googling all over looking for the kinesthetic sphere, there was a little bit related to Montessori school, actually, and learning, kinesthetic mm -hmm. learning. I thought that was interesting. Yeah. But I could never quite find exactly the way you had described it like you just did. Yeah. And it's right. directly related to how we're interacting with horses. And some horses that tend to be aggressive, it's like we're just invading their space without realizing that their yeah. personal space goes out 15, 20, 30 feet, that they have that level of sensitivity. It's not more than an arm's length. And yeah. they're feeling our energy from that distance. And if we just sort of go charging into their space without paying attention, they remind yeah. us sometimes right. in not so subtle ways. <laughs> <laughs> um, true. And, you know, they, our awareness of their space, that even that changes us. We move toward them less aggressively, yes. you know, because it's not, again, the, the whole end gaining thing, it's not just about getting there. Yes. It's about how I move. Um, and that's was, what makes the bigger difference with horses than any technique or strategy I've ever found. I go, that is the dynamic language that's always being understood by the horse, even if we're a little bit oblivious that we're mixing up our words, we don't speak the language fluently. And But that sort of, again, another AT idea, pausing and sort of letting the horse's attention or reaction or body language 
tell us where they're comfortable, how much space they need. Wow. And just just entering that space in a different way, just like giving ourselves more space instantly changes our body coordination. Sort of asking permission, can I come into your space to the horse? It, it, it changes It changes everything. Yeah. It changes our relationship to ourselves mm -hmm. as well as the horse. Because we are essentially saying to ourselves, I have time. Yeah. I, I was reading just this morning in a, a little, it, it's actually a book that was written for teachers. Um, it was a series of lectures given by one of Alexander's primary teachers in his school in London, a man of, uh, by the name of Walter Carrington. And he was, he, he was a writer himself. And he was talking about um, a writing school, a, a very prestigious writing school in Berlin. And that the, the, the teacher would have a group of cadets, he called them mm -hmm. in, the, in the school, it must have been a military type, you know, school. And um, he would say to the students, what is the first thing that you want to say to yourself when I give the command canter? Mm. And, the, and the answer was, I have time. <laughs> yeah, and everybody listening to this podcast just leaned forward and got tight. <laughs> That's <laughs> got prepared for speed. <laughs> yeah, and he was looking for something different that person. And that person was not an Alexander teacher. He was just one heck of a writing instructor. Yeah. You know, and maybe he had had Alexander lessons. I, he didn't say in the, it was a transcript of a lecture that Walter Carrington had given, but. But I happened? think the really great, you know, horse masters that what they're trying to communicate, maybe in a slightly different language, I find is no different than what was communicated to me in Alexander technique work because it's what works. And when you're dealing with a horse that is a prey animal, has basic permanent peripheral vision, super sensitive, right? They're, so that's why they have such a big kinosphere is because uh, in that same research paper that talked about how horses see, it was also the sense of touch particularly around the horse's barrel, measured higher than the human fingertip. Wow. And I go, and that's where we sit. That's where we squeeze with our legs, use our spurs. And yet it's as sensitive as more sensitive than a human fingertip. So I go, they have like little invisible antennas that they're feeling, you know, from their core really from the middle of their body they're sensing all of this information way before there's physical touch isn't that amazing and not surprising at all yeah and so like that riding instructor to what were his words again exactly that um, you said i have time i have time that is another game changer with the riding is people think as soon as we're going to pick up speed, everybody sort of, you know, either most people intuitively lean forward and get ready for the speed. Some people have learned to lean back and like drive the horse into that speed. But really the thought that we're going together like two dancers, I have time. The horse either responds to my leg aid and picks up the canter or he doesn't. Right. I don't have to rush this yeah. thing, you know, except it's in the positive. It's, it's not a negative. I don't have to rush this. It's the positive. I have time. I have time. I yes. have time. And that allows me to expand because I'll tell you that another thing that causes our body to narrow is the perception that we don't have time. Oh, I see it in traffic all the time. <laughs> Like, yeah, somebody <laughs> leaning forward, just like getting ready for a canter. And I go, the car is not going to go any faster than your foot makes it go. It's, you know, leaning over the steering wheel and getting yeah. tense and gripping. I go, it's, it's not going to make the car go any faster. 
But yeah. that's what we tend to do if we're in a hurry or we're anxious or we feel like we're being stymied by traffic. It's yeah. it's that same impulse, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. Completely so the, agree. The kinesphere, I love that. And the I think keeping that three-dimensional spatial awareness, it's like I can arrive where I'm going, bringing that's that funny. whole bubble with me. Like I'm not... Yes trying to pop through the front of the bubble to get there any faster. It's like we, we're arriving and we have time. And, and we have time. And, you know, you'll notice all your systems start to slow down. You, you don't have to, you, you lose those, that kind of panicked feeling and, you know, they, like, no, it's just, it's going to come to me. That canter is going to come to me, you know, Yeah. <laughs> whatever. Yes, we'll get there when we get there, or the horse may have some figuring out to do. It's not always immediate. Sometimes they just speed up a little, and I go, oh, that was a good try. Let's try it again, instead of the canter. <laughs> right. Yes. So I do want to talk about the lateral muscles um, okay. in the human body, and the horse's muscles. I've done some podcasts on those are... There's only two muscle muscles in the horse's body that are the pure fiber type of postural or um, posturally supportive. Every other muscle in their body is a combination of locomotion and postural or stability. And the two muscles that are purely stabilizing functions were the diaphragm and the muscle right that runs above the tail head over the sacrum and coccyx. And I thought that it, it kind of the diaphragm being a stabilizing muscle fiber type, I found fascinating. And of course that made me think of you because you're the one who taught me about these lateral muscles in the feet and the pelvic floor and the diaphragm, which is all I could remember. I'm going to let you expand on it, but it helped me fill out that three-dimensional bubble we're talking about and kind of find some width, kind of find a connection in the saddle where I felt wrapped around the horse rather than sort of perched on top. Oh, I love that phrase, wrapped around the horse, um, making that connection with the horse rather than just perching up there like a little bird. Yeah. You know? So yeah. can you tell me, just like teach me again about these lateral muscles because okay. I love that. So the thing I love about, so lateral muscle means that they're essentially parallel to the floor. The sole of your foot it is a series of lateral muscles. Um, it runs left to right versus sort of up and downish. But yeah, that's right. Or front to back. Mm -hmm. You know, the majority of the muscles in your foot are going to go this way. <laughs> front to back. Got it. Front to back. Um, and so we have most of our muscles are, you know, essentially vertical mm. in, yes. in our body. But there are four sets of muscles. Um, and I'm talking sets of muscles, not just like a muscle here and a muscle there. But right. Not a specific. Mm hmm. Right, four sets of muscles that are more parallel to the floor. And um, it is the soles of your feet and your pelvic floor and your diaphragm, like your horse, mm -hmm. under your chin and your soft palate. Interesting. Those are the lateral muscles. And um, they are points of either buoyancy or interference you know we can allow them to be open and receptive mm -hmm. to our weight or we can grip and then the weight comes in and just kind of goes wait i can't get through help you know <laughs> um so let me talk about that a little bit yeah but, so many of us have been taught that our muscles fight gravity, which I don't believe is true in reality. Like our muscles are designed to perfectly work 
with gravity. Mm. And you know how when the astronauts go into space, their muscles atrophy because there is no gravity. Exactly. You know, and their, their um, bones yeah. age rapidly as well. Right. They're yeah. up there for too long. So muscles are not fighting gravity. They are working with it. Yeah. They love gravity. And here's what they do. They receive and they, they, and that activates them and they rise. And so they push back up. That's right. That, that mm. This is always going on in our muscles. So think about those lateral muscles. Weight is falling through your body, right? Because that's the force of gravity. It's coming inward. It's, it's moving through your body. But the muscles are going bing, bing. I think of, and with those lateral muscles, oh my gosh, the weight comes in, bing. They're like trampolines, bing. Yeah, <laughs> you know? or I, I was even listening to a physics lecture Okay, totally geek out moment, but it, it's not, you know, gravity under, and I talk about it that way because that's the main perception people have, but gravity is not actually what's pulling us down, keeping us on earth. Space is pushing us down and gravity or the chair we're sitting in is pushing us up and that up down relationship is really what the muscles are designed to filter those forces, manage those yes, forces. And it's going on simultaneously all the time through constantly. All constantly. And when we talk about interference with the horse, we can also interfere with our own coordination, you know. And that was what I was talking about when we talked about your lessons you know, and that really all, all that was happening on my end was reminding those interferences that they, they really don't need to be there, <laughs> that they can fall away and allow and, you, and, and allow what Alexander called primary coordination to emerge. So, so you're just peeling off the interference. Or... Yeah, and I'm not even doing that. I'm just saying... Is there this, a little bit of a little bit of space here? Yeah. <laughs> Is there a little bit of space here that you haven't claimed in a while? I, I'm I'm doing very very little. Yeah. Um, basically, just asking questions with my hands, and your body was, you know, as most people are, very receptive, and and you know, again, it, it started to say, oh, I don't need that amount of tension. And it's tension that's going to interfere with weight moving freely through our bodies. It, it's not that there's no, no tension. It's not that. It is excess tension. It's tension that's imbalanced, imbalanced, yes. you know. So when you and I were working with the lateral muscles, we were just simply giving your you uh, sort of a, a, a jumping in place, I guess I want to say, you know, so that I get a checking in place and you can say, well, is there, you know, am, am I gripping through my feet? Because if I am, my trampolines aren't working, you know, am I gripping through my torso so that my pelvic floor trampoline cannot allow, the weight's never getting there in the first place, so I'm not having good contact with my horse. You know, um, And that was that, how you described that muscle when, it, when I felt it as well. It was a very similar experience to like a trampoline. I go, it's not a completely slack muscle and it's not a completely tight muscle. I mm -hmm. would say it's, it's act, gently active, but you feel that buoyancy of either the bottoms of your feet or the pelvic floor or the kind of a spontaneous deep breath, which must be the diaphragm. And that Absolutely. relaxing, I forgot the one about the under the chin and the soft palate, but that would be why maybe the jaw sort of relaxes, the face relaxes or softens. Absolutely. I, I and say. if this... And any one of them can can interfere with the others. So for instance, this area up here, 
has a lot because it's around your breathing apparatus. Around the jaw. It can, the... Affect, it can affect the ability of the diaphragm to do its job. And diaphragm can interfere with the, the weight that wants to move through towards your pelvic floor, you know. So they, again, excess tension in those areas can create um, sort of a domino effect, you know, through your body. Um, and again, that, just like that little saying, I have time, yeah. you know, can be a real game changer for helping us to stay present in this moment instead of anticipating what's about to happen. You know, something like, gee, let me, check in, let, me, let me check in with my lateral muscle groups. You know, is, is there more effort going on here than I need right now? And, and I so think what became kind of by accident was in the hands-on work I did with you, when I really felt those lateral muscles gently activating, I felt so light in my whole body. I, my ease of motion, my, I, I just had a sensation of lightness and weightlessness um, in just walking around your living room. Right. <laughs> and, and so in sort of searching for that sensation again, I found it in reverse by going, oh, if I sort of play with my um, skull, neck, spine, pelvic use and sort of shift around my personal space bubble, what I found was there was a place where maybe my skeleton was in better alignment with the gravitational force and that those muscles activated as a result of the skeletal coordination or alignment, but I could never, they're not muscles that you can go to the gym and work out, right? And it totally, yeah, can happen. you, you yeah. really can't with those muscles, but they became a critical feedback loop for me to know because every horse you get on, every saddle you sit on, different terrain, different days, different times a day, your perception of your balance is not always accurate. And so I go, okay, that's my habit or my, my, my mind's perception of balance. I have learned is not the more accurate perception of balance, my body and that sort of gentle activation of those lateral muscles became a very important guide to me to kind of keep refining my skeletal, my axial skeletal, skeleton, especially yeah. the head, spine, pelvis, rib cage to go, where is, where does that need to be? And sometimes my brain was like, oh no, that's not possible. But all of a sudden, the arches of my feet gave me that little trampoline feeling again, or my my core engaged, but it wasn't the hi ya kind of oh I'm gonna make my core work. It was it was just gently there, working mm -hmm. engaged. Just gently there. That's a that's a great phrase because you've you've hit on what how Alexander is taught and how it must be taught. We're not going for a feeling. The feeling is a result. Right. The feeling is a result. You know, classic Alexander says, as you mentioned, you know, I'm going to be aware of this head, neck, spine relationship. Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to invite these muscles to free in my neck. And that's going to let my head come into balance. It's going to let my spine lengthen. Are you loving what's happening in your body right now as I'm going through? Just this talking direction? about it. Yes. It's, no, it's, yeah. wonderful. <laughs> it's, nothing, it's nothing to do. There's nothing to do. Yeah. It's, it's a response. And it, 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 there is something about that that's, that also resonates with the horse rider relationship. You can't make it happen. Well, it's you completely can't. backwards from how we're taught to either work out our, our own bodies or train horses because I loved your words. The, the muscle use or activation is more the result 
it's the end of the domino chain, not the beginning. It's the last yeah. domino, not the first. And yeah. it's sort of finding, like exploring, where do I belong in space right now doing what I'm doing? And if I really adjusted myself minutely, that activation of the lateral muscles was like, now you're there and everything could just sort of soften and widen and lengthen. But my brain was like, no way. You're, you're like, <laughs> <laughs> my brain's going, you're way too far forward. You're way too far left. You're way, you know, you're, you're, this can't be right. And I, and, but interestingly, if I sort of go, okay, that's just how brains respond. No big deal. That once the brain realizes it's more efficient, the brain gets on board. The brain gets on board. It's just, you know, your brain's a computer. It's going to, to tell you to keep doing the habit until you show it something better. Do you know? Yeah. But realizing wow. that the muscle use was the last domino was huge for me because I go, that information I'm getting from my own body, from which muscles mm -hmm. are active, which ones are not, was a self-correcting mechanism. My body knew where I was more than my brain did. My body knew if my joints my were knows. open and available and all yeah. of that. Yeah. When I was teaching in the university, I wrote a, a book and the title of it is Your Body Knows um, because it does. Um, however, I don't want to disparage our brain because our thinking can have a great deal to do. I mean, yes, it begins absolutely. with a thought. You know, all, what you've been talk talking about, about curiosity is so, so, so important. It is, it's at the heart of everything. If I can just get curious and explore, I'm going to discover something. You yes. Know? So when you put your brain into that mindset, so to speak, <laughs> you know, when, when, when we, when we, allow, when we just let ourselves be curious, well, what is going on with my head and spine relationship? What is going on with my lateral muscles? What's up there? Yeah. You know, then your brain gets really receptive and waits for, for answers as opposed to trying to make something happen. Yes. And that is no different than learning to listen to the horse's movement or the horse's energy. And it's that sort of the brain can sometimes be in charge for so long, we quit listening to the body intelligence or That's listening... Funny. Or listening to the horse. And I agree, if the brain's not on board, it's a constant battle. But once we understand that it, it's a back and forth conversation between the, the sort of the body intelligence and, and what our brain is perceiving, because I go, the power of the human brain is we can normalize anything. That's a tremendous power. Right. And so we can be like this, you yeah. know, and the brain and the brain thinks that's the norm, you know. So, so like um, a horse and rider, I go, if the horse's barrel, if they lose their balance, the barrel can roll to one side, which will pull the saddle off to one side as well as the rider. But because it can be chronic, um, the human brain can override that and create it as normal. But if we, I'll tell people, if you look down at your own thigh bones, you might notice they're not symmetrical. And if you really listen, one leg will feel loose and one leg will be tight. And I said, that tight leg is just doing its job of helping you not fall off. And so if you listen to the tighter leg, then you might move yourself a little towards that tight leg. That's your intelligence that keeps you on the back of the horse and not falling off, but maybe not, not falling off. Yeah, not falling off is different than your best potential ride. I go, we all have to start mm -hmm. with not falling yeah. off. But, but to really listen to the horse, like 
even though you weren't telling my body what to do as an Alexander Technique instructor, there was, or maybe you have a, a better way of saying it, that you were sort of helping quiet the resistance to the the inherent blueprint of the body. Two things. One is waking up your kinesthetic sense to what you were really doing mm. as opposed to as opposed to the habit, you know. So after a while, we don't notice these chronic tensions anymore. You know, they're just part of the norm. And so part of what was going on with you and with every Alexander student is awakening to the interference. Yeah. Know? And then, and then beginning to, as you did so beautifully, changing our thinking so that we know that, that that's not where we want to be and allowing something else to happen. And that's where all that curiosity comes in. Well, I wonder what would happen if I'm not so locked up. Wonder yeah, would... and, and in a nonverbal communication with horses, I go... Learning to listen to our own body is just learning to listen. And so in the nonverbal conversation, if we're end gaining, if we're saying, oh, I know it's inside leg to outside rein or my horse has to canter right now, all of that is putting so much tension in our bodies that we can't hear the horse. We can't listen with our mind through our bodies. Yeah. And maybe that's what was happening for those cadets in Berlin who were told you have time is yeah. to give themselves, give themselves and their horse. So, and, and Alexander said, you have to stop. You have to stop doing what you don't want to do in order to do what you do want to do. So it's in the pause. It's in that moment of just that, that moment of, pause, or Alexander called mm -hmm. it inhibition, mm -hmm. that moment of, oh, let me just take a moment here. Yeah. Then I get to make a choice as opposed to I'm at the mercy of my habit. Yes. Yes. And that pause is way harder than it sounds. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it is because your brain's going, got to get there, got to get there, got to get there. Yeah. We, the predators, you know, got to get there. Well, and I think too, once you have a physical habit, it's efficient. Brains love efficiency so that they can think about new things. And mm -hmm. so it's like, wait a minute, we don't want to stop. We're fine. We still manage to <laughs> you know, get that cup of coffee down our throat and keep going. And so that moment of pause is, I think the reason it's harder than it sounds is because the brain goes, no, 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 we have things to do, places to go. Like, we don't want to rethink how we put our socks on and pick up our coffee or get on a horse or sit on a horse. Like the brain sort of really objects at first because it loves efficiency. And it, at least the current habit was efficient. So changing the habit is an inefficient period. That's well said. But then once you, once you find the better use of your body, or the same is true with horses. The horses are across the board calmer more interested in working with people, more interested in having a two-way conversation during the ride. They it's handle so stress better. Yeah, we're more responsive to them um, and they are more responsive to us. Yeah. And with, um, with riders too, I was coming across a lot, people who were doing core strengthening, core workout. And I go, there's nothing wrong with that. But when you get on the back of the horse, instead of people were thinking, I have to activate my core in order to get my balance. And Which is really just making yourself tense. Tense and stiff and losing your balance. And mm -hmm. I and, it, and losing losing the the information that you need to get from the horse. You 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 cannot yeah. sense the horse under you when you're like that. Yeah, you can't balance in isolation of the movement. 
I go, that's like trying to stand still on a boat in the middle of the ocean. I go, your balance has to interact with the waves of force. That's the only way you can balance. But it was a big shock, I think, to a lot of people. I go, you're going to recognize when your core activates, but it's because you're adjusting your balance accurately. So you don't try to activate the core. You keep searching until the core activates. So and I wish I that wish was so much. Yeah, that was backwards. That was big. That was big. Yeah, mm -hmm. I wish so much we had a word that meant um, a word that some Alexander teachers use is body self hyphenated, because we bring our whole selves to our horse. You know, it's not just our bodies. And we tend to think of our mind up here and our body down here. Mm. And, you know, just and we leave out our whole personality and all the stuff that, you know, we bring and, and the horse's personality. Yeah. You know, but I wish we had a single word that if anybody ever comes up with one, I'd love to know about it. So that, the, that, the body self is what it's referred to in yeah, Alexander that, terms? Right. Yeah. Well, some teachers use that um, and, and have for a long time. There's a teacher from the, um, who, yeah, just, they would sometimes body mind, but it's not enough to me. Body mind isn't enough. Um, no, and, and the way I really break it down in the teaching I do, whether it's a horse or the rider, is again everything to me keeps coming back into threes three-dimensional it's it's just like this interplay it's never a one-dimensional way yeah. of being or yeah. doing and yeah. so when i'm working with behavior i go that is i can't separate the thought from the emotional state but that can happen without physical activity and as soon as we're probably not, <laughs> I disagree well, with you there. Can... <laughs> There's going to be a physical response. To... Yeah, we have an emotional component. Uh, what the mind is focused on, I just call the mental component and uh -huh. then the physical component. Yeah. And what's so interesting, like with the horses in trying to show people how to read their mental emotional state, I go, they have postural changes that are so obvious. I go, if they're dominant in the fight flight nervous system, they go into what AT world calls startle for people. I go, horses do the same thing. They arch the back, they rotate the pelvis backwards, they shorten and lift the neck and the chin. And it's the same posture. That's the posture of fight and flight. And the posture of rest and digest is grazing. I go long neck, right? Stable and head low. I go, so whether you get there by doing nothing, letting a horse work through the mental emotional memory, the trigger, or just like you putting hands on me, change, you know, adjusting the coordination is going to affect the mental emotional state and the mental emotional state is going to affect the coordination yeah. it, and what you think about will affect the emotions. The emotions can affect the thought. Like I go, it all just goes back and it forth back constantly. And yeah. So I just would love a, a word that encompasses all of that. So. Oh, let me know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we just, our language is too dualistic. I wonder if there's, you know, anything in some other language that's not as dualistic as English, you know, that they might come up with something like that. It is interesting because I've played around in it, trying to explain balance. What will come up a lot is I go, if we think of it like a triangle, I go, let's say the, uh, like a pyramid shaped triangle, our duality creates two of those points but integrating dualities is what creates the third point oh that's nice that's kind and, of like they meet in the middle, middle. <laughs> yeah it's a little bit of this and, and a, 
yeah or it's the best part of this and the best part of that so yeah it doesn't have to be black like i go black and white gray is its own color Mm -hmm. right so we have black we have white and when you take a little bit of both you have gray but gray is its own color so it's not black and it's not white it's a third it's a third option And when we get into this sort of dualistic thinking, it's it's like, well, if we really look at it from a point of from a place of balance, balance is always an integration. And you know, I, in doing some research in physics, it's balance is where all the opposing forces are equalized to the point that you have a zero sum. And I went, oh my gosh, that's what it feels like too. That's what it feels like, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So that yeah. equalization or, and in a body, it's so complicated. You can't just equalize. Well, yeah. And that's why, you know, Alexander said, you cannot make this happen. You have to allow it to happen. You have to let the habit go so that your body can do what it knows already. And there was another Alexander who used to emphasize, you have to let the body do what it knows, which you don't know. <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. No, yeah. and that's where sort of that willingness to explore. There it, you it, go. If we think we're in a good posture... We've closed off the whole, let me see if I get it right, kinesphere. It's like there's only one right way. And that's what riders will do a lot with their riding position is there's only one right position. And I go. Right. And, and you're trying to think of a million different cues. Yes. You know, that you're going to give yourself how wide your shoulders are going to be, what your hands are supposed to be doing, your right. wrists, your, your eyes. You can't do it. You can't. Yeah, can't do it. It's, it I mean, you know, you just make yourself and your horse crazy. And very stiff, which means you can't feel your horse anymore. And Absolutely. then your horse feels cut off. Mm -hmm. And you're not just... a team anymore. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So this has been fun, Jana. And we got to wrap it up. But I do want to, I know you have a lot of great visual stuff. And you also have a website, Move Well hyphen live well dot yeah. com yeah and so if people wanted to get in touch with you i will Absolutely. put your contact information in the show notes and you're now based out of i'm based um in out of port angeles washington okay that is a long move from florida yes that was a long move from Florida if I'd gone a little bit I think maybe 50 miles west of here I would have been at the most western point of the United States oh. <laughs> of the continental United States yeah so. that's pretty far west <laughs> so I'm almost almost to the Pacific Ocean yeah yeah well and I'd like to get back together with you for the horse geeks classroom that I do on YouTube especially with some of the fantastic pictures and and stuff you've shown me in the past I think it's so cool and I know that on your website you have a ton of information for people even if they're not local right yeah that's true yeah yes so, so thanks for having me this was well, so much fun I know. Thank you for coming because we haven't chatted in such a long time. And this is why I yeah. like to do the podcast. I get to catch up with all these people I know and love. Well, thanks for making me one of your people. I really enjoyed it. Oh, and, of course. Uh, yeah. No, of, you're of all... our time together. And it was so funny. I would tell people, I go, the best riding lessons I ever had was learning again how to walk and sit and stand in somebody's living room. I said that changed my writing completely. <laughs> That's great. That's good. And it wasn't, the horse wasn't even in the picture, but it was. It wasn't you. even there, but they appreciate that you learned all those things. Dramatic differences. Every improvement I made, the horses gave me a lot of feedback that I was on the right track. Yay. That's good news. 
Yes. All right. So thanks for joining us, everybody. Mm -hmm. And thank you, awesome Jana, you. for being a guest today. And it's Jana Tift, you guys, once again. And the uh, website is movewell, one word, hyphen, livewell.com. And so look Jana up, especially if you're yeah. in the Northwest U.S. And she's awesome. I hope you can get together with her. Okay. All right. Thanks, thanks everybody. Bye. Bye.